Hello and welcome to the latest edition of Inside the Americas. Here's what's coming up for you this week. Anger at racial discrimination and police brutality continues to simmer across the United States. We bring you a report which looks at the rising number of pro-Trump and right-wing vigilante groups. Our international affairs commentator Douglas Herbert will be giving us his take on the looming presidential election as the campaigning heats up ahead of the November poll. And we'll take a closer look at how the global health emergency has affected the capital of cinema. Well, we start with the civil unrest which continues to grip many American cities. Unrest which was sparked many months ago by the killing by white officers of the black man George Floyd. Scuffles between anti-racism protesters and self-styled far-right vigilantes are becoming more frequent, fueled by the current president's view that this is a legitimate citizen's response. Yuka Hoye has more. In Portland, Salt Lake City or Kenosha, armed men patrol the streets, but they're not in uniform. We're out here trying to protect residents, we're trying to protect the innocent people. Self-appointed vigilantes are being seen more and more frequently as anti-racism protests. But what exactly is their goal? We went to Olympia, Washington State, to meet Peter Diaz, founder of American Wolf, a roving group of armed activists. We're just not a militia. I'm, but you have guns. Yeah, but I'm an American. Americans have guns. I refuse to sit back and watch my country be destroyed and dismantled around me. Members of American Wolf call themselves peacekeepers. Diaz created the group in late April to fight against anti-government protests that he claimed were led by far-left extremists. They want some sort of socialist or communist government, and so they're trying to change what our government is by destroying our country. They travel around the country, often staging counter-protests in Black Lives Matter hotspots, armed with what they call defensive weapons. So it's just a standard paintball? Pepper spray, a baseball bat, and zip-tie handcuffs are also in his car. These would be to, to detain somebody if need be uh, to prevent violence. Where are the police? Do you see any police out here? He also carries a lethal weapon. So I open my hand like this, so it's not like my hand is on the, you know, like this. We followed Diaz to a pro-Trump rally where we found another far-right militia group guarding the site, known as Three Percenters. One of the most organized paramilitary groups in the United States, it gives combat training to its members. That's perfect, yep. And in South Carolina, we spoke with the head of pro-gun militia One Republic. As President Trump shifts the blame on Democratic politicians for the growing civil unrest, far-right vigilantes seem increasingly energized to take matters into their own hands. Violence is spreading across the country. I'm not going to say there is a limit. We want peace, but we are not scared of war. A recent survey showed one in three American voters believed their country to be on the brink of another civil war. We showed Truett footage of a deadly shooting by a 17-year-old Trump supporter that killed two protesters in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Anybody that can watch this whole video can see that it is self-defense. Armed militia groups are not illegal in the United States where carrying a gun is a constitutional right. Fears of post-election violence are already rising as armed civilians have increasingly come into public view. Well, there are now less than eight weeks to go before voters finally get to have their say about who they want to sit in the White House next. Donald Trump's promise to protect Americans from violence is the centerpiece of his re-election strategy. It's a strategy based on fear at a time when racial unrest fueled by claims of police brutality and injustice have sparked episodes of urban violence on the fringes of otherwise peaceful protests. Our international affairs commentator Douglas Herbert, who's covered several 
several U.S. presidential elections for France 24 uh, joins me now. Now, Doug, uh, Donald Trump is the uh, self-proclaimed law and order president. He paints an apocalyptic uh, picture of an America where no one would be safe if Joe Biden was to win this White House mm -hmm. race. Uh, we've heard this uh, message before, and you say that it's sort of hardwired into America's political culture. Absolutely. This, this idea of law and order war on crime, getting tough on crime, by whatever name you want to call it. Uh, it's been on the political landscape in America for over a generation. You go back to the 1950s, 1960s, uh, the height of the civil rights movement for Afri African American rights in America, uh, when you had entire large cities in America literally in flames. You had riots. It was the year that Martin Luther King, Robert F. Kennedy were assassinated. To call it a tumultuous year would be putting it mildly. Um, but that was really the heart of where law and order uh, uh, began. You could go back to 1964, actually, a guy named Barry Goldwater. He was a Republican candidate against uh, against the, the Democrats at the time, Lyndon uh, Johnson. He was the one who brought up this whole law and order theme. And uh, what happened was it was not successful for him, but another Republican ran with that theme. Two years later, 1966, a man named Ronald Reagan, you might have heard of him, he was running for governor of California at that time, not yet president. He took up the uh, populist uh, baton, if you will. He ran with it, um, and he said he was going to crack down on student uh, protests at the University of Berkeley in California. But the real key moment in this whole law and order historical evolution, where it really began, is Richard Nixon, 1968, running for President of the United States, he made law and order the centerpiece of his campaign. And he did it, you might say, in a rather alarming way. Watch this campaign ad. Let us recognize that the first civil right of every American is to be free from domestic violence. So I pledge to you, we shall have order in the United States. vote like your world depended on it. Uh, sounds familiar there, uh, Tom. We're hearing that today. Look, Richard Nixon uh, basically uh, accused his rival for the presidency, uh, a Democrat named Hubert Humphrey, of being soft on crime. Uh, that's a familiar refrain in uh, politics today, presidential politics. Implicit in all this is a racist message. Let's just say it straight, a racist message. And that is this myth, this idea in the American imagination of the angry black man, minorities, black men who are going to come and invade your community, your white gated communities, your affluent white, white communities, and they are going to basically pillage your towns, lay waste to them. Um, Lyndon Johnson, just to be fair here, a Democrat. He was the man you might know for the great society without poverty, no racial exclusion. He also launched his own war on crime. So it's Democrats and Republicans, but this is mostly a Republican campaign strategy. But the Democrat Joe Biden remains very much the odds-on favourite to win this November. But the latest average of nationwide polls suggests that um, the race is very much uh, tightening in, of course, those key battleground yeah. states. Does this mean that Donald Trump is now turning the tide in any way? Well, the polls uh, are tightening, as you say. And, you know, and the filmmaker, Michael Moore, who called the last election and said five reasons Trump will win in 2016, he ended up being right. He's done the same again, five reasons Trump will win. Does that mean Trump's going to, uh, you know, close this gap and win? Not necessarily. You're absolutely right. Battleground states, and we're talking some key ones, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, which really could determine the outcome of this election. Biden's no longer in the high single digits ahead where he was like five, six weeks ago. Now it's more like three to five points spread. It is close. Closing and Donald Trump's playing to the, the fear of crime, law and order message, it's clearly having some sort of effect. That said, the question will be, at the end of the day, will Donald Trump's bungling, and that's all you can call it, of the COVID crisis, will that perhaps Trump, excuse the pun, uh, voters' concerns when they walk into the polls? Will other concerns carry the day? And if that is the case, and fear and, and law and order do not play enough in Donald Trump's favor, then Joe Biden will, will win this presidency. It, it's, there's a very little time for him to close the gap right now. Could he obviously do it? Yes, we saw it in 2016, but this is a different country, a new pandemic, and an economy on the verge of a nervous breakdown in the U.S. Okay, Douglas Herbert, thank you very much. Well, as the clock ticks down to Election Day, the COVID-19 pandemic is still hitting the U.S. economy hard. One of the country's more iconic industries has seen output grind to a halt. Catherine Bennett has more on how the virus has knocked some of the spark out of the silver screen in Hollywood. It's empty and echoing at Universal Studios. Entire towns for westerns, but with no cameras to film them. 
In Hollywood studios, the lights have gone out. And many films haven't made it to cinemas. The release of Christopher Nolan's hotly anticipated film Tenet was postponed twice. But ticket sales since its launch have exceeded expectations. If the results for Tenet are any indication with a global gross of around 150 million and counting, they made a good move in waiting for theaters to come back. They're going to earn back their production budget and then some. It just may take longer than in traditional times. The latest James Bond will now be released in November. After an original release date of April. Disney's live-action Mulan was delayed three times before its release. And Wonder Woman 1984 will hit screens in October. Some production has started again. Here, near Atlanta, in a camp styled like a military barracks, 300 actors and crew are in lockdown together. They received COVID-19 tests when they first arrived and are tested every four days. Where everybody checks in, stays in their room until the testing come back. We had two positives that were in the camp before we started. So we were able to get them help and get them out of the camp so that we can maintain uh, the bubble. Individual meals are served in each room. Social distancing is respected and masks are mandatory, apart from on set. There were no loopholes. There was no way around it. Everyone was holding each other accountable. But Hollywood is having to budget. Adding these extra healthcare precautions costs millions of dollars. This production company in Los Angeles still hasn't reopened. There's going to be a big line item in pretty much everyone's budget about what has to be spent for people to feel safe going back to work. In the US, two million jobs depend on the film and television industry. But for now, no one really knows when the cameras will start rolling again. And that's all for today's show. Thanks for watching and we'll see you once again soon for the next edition of Inside the Americas here on France 24. The world is ever-changing. The news doesn't wait. That's why at France 24, we'll always be there to help make sense of world events. For the best international coverage, 24 hours a day, no matter what. France 24, with you everywhere, all the time. Liberté, égalité, actualité.